So basically, they are asking Washington State dismissed the lawsuit that uh, Glacier Northwest brought against the Teamsters uh, and basically saying it needed to go to the Labor Board. That was their jurisdiction, which personally on a sidebar, I think that's the correct ruling. They're 100 um, percent right. Yeah. Any any egregious behavior. Well, quote unquote, egregious behavior, which in this case, we'll get into it. There was no egregious behavior. I agree. But I agree. any case where like the question of quote unquote egregious behavior is present. Uh, the labor board decides that. So the Washington state court was 100% right that they're like, this right. is not, you got to take this to the labor board. Right. So, and, I right. mean, by the way, you don't have much here, just so you know. But the Supreme Court, as anti worker as they are, you know, we'll see well, what they Well, so think. what I think, what I think is really problematic, and I want to clarify this because I think this is far more detrimental than ruling on whether, uh, you know, union members can strike or not. I think they're trying to chill and scare workers, uh, Glacier, to be clear, Glacier Northwest. So it's, so this case really doesn't re revolve around the right to strike, right? It revolves around whether individual workers can be held liable or responsible for property damage that might be caused right. during the strike. So if you tell a worker that they are personally liable for property damage that might occur during a strike, they're gonna be afraid to go on strike. And I think that's the point, right? This is why big business would want would want SCOTUS to rule on this. It would be a huge win for them for that reason alone. Um, so the case basically revolves around, I started talking about the cement trucks. So they go, the Teamsters go on strike, the cement trucks are brought back to their facility. Um, and with intention, knowing that there was cement in them, the, the workers left the drums spinning. At that point, the management had a choice to make. They could either continue um, to deliver the cement at the locations that they were out to go to, or they could dump the cement and deal with it that way, which they dump excess cement every day is my understanding. This is not unheard of. If they don't use all the cement at the site and it comes back, they have to deal with the excess cement there at the facility. So mm -hmm. no, uh, that, those that were the correct. options. I've seen the so, Sopranos. So yeah. <laughs> Sorry, continue. So they didn't, dam no cement trucks were damaged. They, the management decided to dump the cement and have it hauled away. There's a, a cost to that, but you know, that's whatever. That's just the cost of doing the business. Maybe you should just pay your workers better. Isn't that the point? So um, really what this is revolving around is that right there, the, the cement. So now we had, we heard arguments coming from both uh, groups of judges, the liberal judges and the conservative judges. Um, at one point, John Roberts, um, I quote something along the lines, is is it OK for the milk to spoil, meaning the cement, but not OK to shoot the cow, meaning the um, cement truck? Right. Because right now, I guess the way the law is framed, the argument is about whether or not spoiled goods like spoiled cheese, spoiled lettuce. This stuff spoils because the workers are not available to handle those goods. That is considered um, an OK thing to happen because it's not done by intention with the workers, right? The workers aren't intentionally destroying property. Right. It's being destroyed by virtue of their just being a strike and they're not present to work, right? So the, that's the difference between like that and say vandal vandalizing property. Like if I go yes. back to my old workplace and I intentionally destroy the machinery or cause major property damage in that way, that's an entirely different argument. And just everybody present seemed to agree that that was the case, right? So we're arguing at this point over what the cement um, constitutes. They're arguing so, over what egregious behavior, quote unquote, is. And yeah, like, like the, the analogy you gave is, is perfect. I would say to the milk example, what happened here, I mean, keep in mind, by leaving the trucks running, that was an act of good faith. They didn't really I have agree to with do you. that. I agree they with you. They did and that to help the companies. And they said, basically, here it goes. So basically, in the milk uh, analogy, they took the milk and put it in the fridge and said, hey, it's in the fridge. It's up to what you What happens now. next is and up to you. What happened next I, is up yes. to you because we're going on strike. So the company could have drank the milk. They could okay. have uh, sold the milk. They could have uh, made macaroni and cheese. They could have made a cake. <laughs> Instead, they let the milk spoil, and right. then they said, well, this is your fault. Like, no, no, no. They could have left the milk on the shelf if they wanted to. They put right. it in the fridge as an act of good faith, and here's what you guys do anyway. Right. So that br brings me to my next thing that I wrote down. Um, reasonable precautions to, pre to prevent property damage. Were those made? Um, I, I agree with you. I think yes, because they left the drums running. They didn't, you know, there was a choice that had to be made by management at that point. I think they if, went above if, and beyond. I if think they, they went wanted above to destroy the trucks, they would have turned off the drums. The cement would have um, hardened inside the trucks and every single one of those trucks would have been permanently damaged. So um, interestingly enough, Kagan, uh, Brown, Sotomayor, 
all pressed on this as a as much and i think the reason wasn't necessarily that they thought that there was negligence done on behalf of the workers i think it was to press to, uh, they pressed just because they wanted people to be really clear on what the arguments were um i would also say that alito and kavanaugh didn't ask any questions they were silent um as were most of the conservative judges i was not able to get a read on what their opinion was on this because they were very just asking questions and not really giving a reaction to what was said um, you know, so there's something called a Garmin preemption. And again, I'm not a legal scholar, so an attorney could probably explain this better. But when does the state court preempt the federal labor law and the NLRB? So this is the second argument that I think is at the center of this court case. When is it OK for the state court for their um, <clears throat> for them to preempt what the NLRB does traditionally? Obviously, the liberal judges are basically saying, no, the, that's the job of the NLRB. Right. And they are an expert in this area. They handle these cases on the regular. They know the laws inside and out. And if you're unsatisfied with the outcome of your NLRB NLRB case, you can then go to the state court. So I thought that that was a fair read. Um, so on that note, there's a there's two clips I want to play so people can get a little bit more about what we're talking about. Because I'm not sure I understand your answer to the question, whether you think that your test captures conduct that the reasonable precautions test does not. So in your latter half of the answer, mm -hmm. you suggested yes. I took the former half to say no. So maybe I was sure. just misunderstanding. But is, is, does it go further? Does it capture conduct that you think the board's test does not? So it's hard for me to think of in my head a set of facts that would be captured by our test, but not their test. So in that sense, I do think that our test is a subset of their test. But look, it's a might, subset of that. I, I, I think so, but you might be able to come up with a set of facts where there's not overlap. Yeah. I haven't. Been so able if to that's think of one the yet. case, why shouldn't we use the the uh, doctrine, the standard, the words that have always been used in this sphere before? I, I think the main reason is that when you've got something as clear as this, something as egregious as intentional property destruction, it's important to take that clear category of misconduct off the table. Look, we're dealing with ongoing negotiations here, and the parties need to know the rules of the road. What are legitimate tactics in the course of a lawful negotiation? I worry that something as nebulous as, as reasonable precautions doesn't really give the parties the guidance they Mr. need. Mr. Francisco, it, I thought that reasonable precautions was fairly clear. The one items that uh, the board has said are not covered are those where an individual, a union member, is acting in a way that any citizen in the same position would have been held responsible for. So if you libel somebody, somebody, it's not just you, but any other citizen with no legal obligation to you would be liable. Similarly, no person who, um, who's on strike or not can impose intentionally emotional distress. All right? Those are things that categorically we say can't be arguably protected. But when it comes to destruction of property, I always thought you needed a duty that you're breaching. If an employee goes on strike, their duty to you has ended. I can walk by mm -hmm. your plant and the parking lot and see those trucks running. I have no obligation to tell you there's cement in there. I have no obligation to move the truck. I have no obligation to do anything. That's what the employees at that moment, they went on strike. What the government is saying, however, is intentional destruction of property means that I'm taking an affirmative act, not just merely the, mm -hmm. the property perishing on its own. So I think she's doing a really good job of clarifying this point of which way, what is intentional property damage and one is just something that happens by virtue of the workers being on strike. And these are very two different things. So Glacier Northwest is arguing that the fact that these workers, my understanding at least, is the fact that these workers took the cement trucks out full of cement to go to location and then went on strike after the fact somehow represents intentional property action, right. reduction, um, destruction. <laughs> on on their behalf so um i thought that well, i thought her points were really good um the second well, clip and, I... and his claim is absolutely ridiculous the, with, oh, with the workers made an act of good faith and that and that's how they get repaid for it 
they do an act of good faith. They leave the the trucks running for for the company. They didn't even have to do that. They did it. They're under no obligation, as as uh, as she pointed out. They're under no obligation uh, at that point. And you know they're on strike. They're yeah, I mean, they're so on if strike. they wanted, so, yeah, if they wanted to damage the trucks, they would have. Um, you know, I mean, I'm I'm just not let the drums here. going. So I agree with you there. The Supreme Court has no business hearing this. <laughs> this the case, Supreme yeah. Court has no business being involved here. So you know what I what I think is really going on. I think that we are seeing the biggest workers uprising that we have seen in nearly 100 years. And I yeah. think the powers that be know that. So they're going to see if their buddies at the Supreme Court can help out because protocol was not followed here. They know there is a notoriously anti-worker Supreme Court. <clears throat> the Supreme Court is a scam and a political football to begin with. We all know this. So we're watching this kangaroo court in session. And I only hope that that it gets there's enough public outcry that it has to be uh, stopped and that they follow the proper protocol, which is go to the labor board, which is this labor board is worth the salt. They'll favor it in, in honor of the workers because the workers didn't do anything freaking wrong. And guess what? You have a constitutional right to strike. So they're not going to go after that right specifically. They're not going to go after that right head on. They're going to try to beat around it by saying, OK, you can technically go on strike. But now your your company, right. the company can sue you. So if you want to go on strike, you have to worry about that now. You have to prepare for the strike, which in the United States, striking is incredibly hard. Why? Because we don't have living wages and health care is tied to a job and unions have been defanged for 60 plus years. So you take all that and now you add another layer on. And that other layer is you better be ready to pay lawyer fees because they can sue you now because egregious behavior just means anything. You know, because here you have a situation where it was actually the opposite of egregious behavior. They did something for the company they didn't even have to do. And the company is still trying to stick it to them. Right. Well, okay. So, but the company is criminals. Yeah. Okay. So, just to clarify, too, um, just the company's position is that if they really weren't being egregious to begin with, they never would have taken the trucks. They would have just got on strike that morning without taking the trucks full of cement out. So, their argument is that that should not have happened to begin with. I'm, I I would say it's the union's position. They're, they're not arguing in this in court per se, but I would understand why a union would decide to hit them at a moment that it kind of like showed that these workers were essential to the job, to the business, to the profits. Um, so it would make sense to me that they kind of took that middle ground. I don't think they should be punished for it. And I certainly don't think they um, there was intentional property damage there. So the next clip I want to play, this is Judge Brown um, talking to the Teamsters lawyer. I guess I'm not sure I understand what you mean when you when you talk about the distinction. I mean, the, the, the allegation in this case, and you could imagine even hypothetically, is that the union certainly has the right to walk away Yes. And if they're walking away um, and their responsibilities involve perishable goods yes. that as a result of their walking away are going to spoil, right. then that's an incidental harm that is occurring. But you can also imagine a situation in which the union says, we have evidence that we're going to time our walking away. Yes at the very point in which we've poured the thing that can't be recovered. Because if we do it at that point, we're going to destroy the machines. And that is our intent. I don't understand how that is protected and why that isn't any, you know, the same as, as, as the arsonist who says, I'm going to walk away. But as I do, let me strike the match and burn down the factory. So what's always been critical to the board's cases is the extent of the harm, so the aggravated nature of the harm, the foreseeable imminence of the harm, not the intent. And but I'm asking what should be. I, okay, I appreciate that, that it hasn't been clear, but that, I think, is part of the problem. So in terms of the logic of this, shouldn't the line be drawn around the intent in the sense of are, is the union engaging in conduct for the purpose of destroying the property of the factory, or is the union just striking, and if some of the property gets damaged because they're walking away, that's incidental, that's totally protected? So that should not be the test for two reasons, a doctrinal and a statutory. So let me give you the statutory first. Congress in Section 151, the very first section 
of the act observed that strikes generally have the quote intent or necessary effect close quote of causing a variety of economic harm including um, a stoppage of the flow of raw materials and interruptions of operations and certainly Congress was aware of perishables like cheese and milk and concrete in Okay, but that's still not getting to me. The, uh, yes, economic harm is being inflicted when you stop work. Intentionally. You intentionally stop the work. But the question is, can you do something that actually um, intends to affect the property directly to make it the property unsalvageable. We can't get new people in here as a result of the strike and pick up where we left off because you've literally burned down the factory. We agree that you can't burn down the factory, right? We absolutely agree you cannot burn down the okay. factory. All right. You cannot smash things. <laughs> so I think um, her intent here is to really establish a clear uh, definition of what is, is uh, property damage as a consequence of the strike where it wasn't intentional and then what is, you know, intentional vandalism of something of that sort. So um, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Well, I think that, you know, I understand <clears throat> what the lawyer was saying, the points he was bringing up, and I think he was right on. But, you know, the way I see it, and, and again, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not an attorney, so so I'm, I'm hoping he's a couple plays ahead of me. But yeah, <laughs> but I, I mean, I hope so. But but I would have said I would have been like, look, even by like the the um, the standards you set up, they still pass. They did not, quote unquote, burn down the factory. That didn't happen. They did right. not have the intention to destroy anything. They right. walked away. And yes, they when you strike, you are intending to commit economic harm. That's the that's leverage the you have. Yes, hey, that's because the I'm on strike, point. you know, you're facing some consequences. There's right. your cement trucks. By the way, we left them running as an act of goodwill. We didn't have to do that. If we didn't do that, you would have been worse off. We left them running so that it didn't spoil immediately. They could have handled it. The company could have handled it. They chose not to. You know, if they really wanted to, quote unquote, burn down the factory, they could have dumped the cement in the offices or something like that. They, they could have put it in someone's sandwich. There's plenty of things they could have frickin' done if they had the yeah. intent to destroy things. And yes, that is different. Then you cross into the line of egregious behavior which is not permitted. You you can't, you know, if you go on strike, you have the right to strike. You don't have the right to, you know, like 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 just burn down a building. You don't have the right to, you know, if you're striking at Starbucks and someone walks into the Starbucks and, and you, you beat the crap out of them, you can't do that. You know, right. I, I mean, there's a clear defined difference. And in this case, it's so abundantly apparent. There was no egregious behavior whatsoever. They are grasping Whatever is further than a straw, that's what they're grasping for. They're, they're, they're reaching for, they're, they're going beyond the straw. They're not even close to the straw. Um, it is absurd that a court is hearing this right now. This should have been brought to the labor board. The labor board should have laughed. Use the use the. I issue think most people agree with that. So yeah, I mean the labor board should have laughed it out of the out of the office. Well, and it there should is have been there dead. is pending. There is something pending with the NLRB. I'm not sure what the details are on that but it to and me still the supreme court shouldn't be anywhere near here the supreme court well, no this yes is they scam. could kick it back to the state they could just kick it back to the state i don't know why they're even hearing it they shouldn't be hearing it in my opinion but here we are but they're not going to kick uh, it back because the state already did the right thing the state was like okay this is ridiculous go to the labor board and then the supreme and then they got it up to the supreme court through a bunch of like nonsense loophole like whatever corporate corruption and, you know, the Supreme Court is going to freaking rule on this thing that they have no yeah. business weighing in on. They have no business being part of it. That's why. Why would you bring the Supreme Court into this? Well, because you know how anti-labor they are and you know this is going to set a new president that is going to crush workers. I mean, we'll see what happens. Um, I think they are going to rule. My gut is that the reason they took it is to rule on it hopefully this ruling is incredibly narrow but i think the idea that they could make workers uh liable for any kind of property damage that happens whether it was intentional or not is kind of disturbing that's meant to chill it's disturbing the, it's meant to chill it's workers uh, being willing to strike i 100 percent agree with you on that also uh vivek suri argued for the united states they presented an amicus brief um my understanding is they they wanted it to be 
kicked back to the state court. Uh, I didn't get a chance to really go through that because this is all still breaking today. But we'll keep an eye on it and we'll see what happens and report on any um, <clears throat> developments that come next. Yeah, and this goes far beyond just the Teamsters up in Seattle and these cement companies. If they rule on this, oh, a hundred percent it does. That's the point, Ron. That's the point, isn't it? My thing is this: is how often have we seen um, far right entities, whether it's think tanks, wealthy individuals, whatnot, they push for SCOTUS uh, cases to happen, even if they think they might not win them, because they want to change the conversation because they want to set up you know push the overton window further to the right because eventually like with roe v wade if we keep going and keep going 20 years later maybe we might actually get a win because well, we keep pushing that's, the. that's exactly what they're doing here i, I agree. mean that's exactly what they're doing here like again and, and i just want to reiterate it to people the supreme court has no business hearing it this is a scam this is a complete corporate scam, and this is what happens so. when you live in a freaking oligarchy. The Supreme Court reports to nobody. Most of the people on the Supreme Court were not even, you know, like in there due to public opinion. They were they were placed there by presidents right. who didn't even win the popular vote. It's a complete scam. It shouldn't exist. It should be abolished along with the cops. And you know, <laughs> this is just. I mean, I mean, Ron's, this is Ron's out this to is abolish so everything these days. Absurd. <laughs> It is so absurd. I think, listen, in the very least, they should be impeached, several of them, for things that have happened. And also, in the very least, we should get rid of lifetime appointments. This just doesn't make sense. Just I get think, rid of it. Just so, We well, can have other federal courts. We need a high courts. court of some time. Yeah, we could yeah, have. You yeah, can have yeah, other federal something. courts that are actual courts. We don't need the Supreme Court. It's a freaking clown show and not a funny one. Get rid of it. <laughs> no, it's definitely not funny. So well, we'll right. keep an eye on this. But this is yeah. uh, this is a big one, folks. This is a big one, and this is not good.